our peer roundtable for uh, bar and restaurant owners. The Quad Cities Chamber strives to be your one-stop business resource to assist during the coronavirus pandemic, connecting you to reliable and accurate information. There's always a lot of new information to process and respond to during these rapidly evolving and uncertain times. And the Quad Cities Chamber is here for you, advocating for your business at the state and federal levels, providing resources to help you protect the health and workforce of your operations. We're committed to bringing you the latest information as quickly as possible. And in case you missed it, the Quad Cities Chamber just recently uh, launched Reopening Your Business in the Age of COVID-19 Toolkit, which is a 50-page downloadable PDF on our website, and it has best practices and suggested considerations to help you prepare to reopen safely when we get the green light. Um, our COVID-19 resource page is updated daily. That's at quadcitieschamber.com. And if you haven't signed up for e-news, you can do that by scrolling all the way to the bottom of our uh, main page, and you can sign up there. Um, joining us today are Tom Trone and Joel Young. Tom is with Score Quad Cities. Joel is with the Small Business Development Center at Eastern Iowa Community College. Tom is a certified mentor and University of Iowa Venture School faculty member. SCORE Quad Cities mentors helps many local food service businesses uh, today, including counselor, counseling owners, I'm sorry, as they navigate the COVID-19 shutdown. Um, Tom has extensive experience in lots of different industries, including food service. He and his wife, Sue, who is also a SCORE mentor, have owned and operated several restaurants. And we want to thank Tom and Joel both for facilitating our meeting today. Um, we're going to allow time, obviously, for discussion and, and questions from everybody in the room. Um, please keep your microphone on mute until we open for discussions. Um, this is going to be recorded, so uh, be mindful of, of that during your sharing. And um, this is for informational purposes only. So at this point, I would like to turn it over to Tom. Welcome. Thank you, Julie. It's a pleasure to be with you all. We have over 30 people registered for uh, this event, which is an indication that this is a very important topic. Um, uh, before we get into the topic, uh, SCORE is a, an affiliate organization of the SBA. Um, and we have 10,000 mentors across the country in 300 plus uh, chapters that help people start and grow companies, but also help uh, companies uh, navigate issues and problems that they might encounter. Uh, the situation that we're all in the midst of to now is uh, unprecedented. Um, it is creating problems for every sector in our economy. Uh, the food and beverage industry has been impacted uh, more than most. Um, it is a very difficult time, and uh, SCORE and the SBDC, the Chamber, and other resources are available to you all in every sector to help where we can to navigate, uh, to help you survive, to help you rebuild as we go forward. So uh, Joel didn't get a chance to uh, introduce himself. Joel, can you talk a little bit about yourself and the SBDC? Good morning, uh, Tom. Good morning, everyone attending today. So my name is Joel Youngs. I'm the Regional Director for Small Business Development in um, Iowa, and uh, I cover the four counties that are on this end of the state. We, uh, we are a, a, a sister affiliate with SCORE. Both of us are underneath the SBA umbrella, and uh, we work in conjunction with each other to try to uh, moves the small business community forward, allowing them to uh, maximize their profitability and to achieve their goals and desires. My, my background uh, is in finance, so my specialty is uh, with money matters. Uh, we assist people in help, helping them take a look at their financials, uh, finding the holes that, that might be uh, apparent in their financials in their operations, and uh, working to uh, fill those to, uh, again, achieve maximum uh, profitability for them. In addition to that, um, we have assisted clients uh, in this last fiscal year with over $10 million of financing. And so I work with over 43 different lenders uh, 
in our local community, uh, helping our clients uh, get access to capital. And then this latest uh, pandemic issue, uh, we've been counseling people on how to access and utilize their PPP funding as well as their uh, idle or economic entry disaster loans. So Thank you, I'll turn it back to you, Tom. Thank you. Uh, so for your information, we've been working on the structure of this program for a while. Uh, there are three um, uh, registrants on the call with us that I've asked to uh, help provide input into the meeting structure and talking points. Uh, we have Ten Baldwin from Front Street, Dan Bush from Armory Gardens, and Mike Osborne from Mo Brady's, Miss Mamie's, and Half Nelson. Uh, I've known these guys for a while. I, I, I respect uh, who they are and what they do. They're advocates for the industry. Uh, we've been talking about uh, what their, they and their companies are doing during the shutdown period and how they're planning for the future. So I've asked them to uh, seed our conversation and to share experiences as appropriate as we go through. Uh, and we invite any of you to add on or contribute your own as we go through. Uh, this session is an hour long. Uh, we have uh, planned two others uh, coming up later in May and one in June. And we're also going to be communicating with all of you by email, uh, sharing ideas, best practices, experiences, uh, re resources from various different uh, entities and inputs that are important to our industry. So this is just the introduction or a first meeting of our group. But our primary goal is to do whatever we can to help you survive and rebuild and thrive in the food and beverage in industry in the Quad Cities. It's not going to be easy. There will be some structural changes in the industry that will be permanent. Uh, there will be a lot of uh, misunderstanding about what's happening and why. There will be a lot of nervousness amongst our customers and employees. So the path ahead will not be smooth. There will be a lot of uh, white water and uncertainty as we go forward. As we've organized our day, um, there's th three primary topics that we're going to talk about is your experiences and lessons learned while coping with the shutdown, uh, planning for the phase one reopening, which is happening in Iowa uh, very soon, and Illinois is coming later, and then planning for the new normal. Uh, we would all like things to go back to where they were, as they were, uh, but the new normal is there will be some changes in how we have to uh, structure our business models and conduct our services that will probably be permanent in food service from this point forward. And we'll talk about that later. So I'd like to uh, start off by talking about experiences and lessons learned during the shutdown. Uh, all of you uh, probably have experienced the uh, uh, the challenges of the funding programs that have been made available through the federal government and SBA and local lenders. Um, um, you've uh, connected with your local banks. Some of you applied and got funding through the EIDL program early on. Uh, there are a lot of uh, positives about the, the funding that have come to the industry, but as you all know better than anyone, uh, the PPP program doesn't fit the restaurant industry well. So. Some of the issues that we've been uh, talking with you all about and learning ourselves so we can better support uh, your business and application for funding is just uh, what is PPP and other programs like it that are sure to come uh, and how does it work for us and not. Uh, the PPP was uh, uh, focused on covering employee salaries and wages uh, for a short period of time based on a start date when you get the loan funds. It was uh, there to provide money for rent and mortgages and utilities. It provides really no monies to the operation, to you as a business owner operator. It doesn't provide working capital, all the things that are going to be needed to rebuild your business and operate it uh, going forward. PPP really hasn't helped. And in some cases, uh, the PPP program uh, is in conflict with other programs that have been implemented during this time period. Uh, 
for example, the unemployment programs that have been launched in each of the states with the, uh, with the extra perks that have been added to unemployment has made it uh, um, questionable, if not impossible, for employers to bring employees back to work when they're needed. Uh, in some cases, uh, the em employees are afraid to come back to work. They're afraid of their safety. But in many cases, unemployment pays more than what they were getting paid before. So you get people that when you ask them to come back, uh, say, no, I don't want to take a pay cut. Um, I'm going to stay here. I'm going to be safe. Um, call me when my unemployment is up. And as as you all know, that if if they refuse your request to come back to work, then you can um, call the state unemployment office and say that they've refused to come back to work and then their unemployment uh, benefits go away. So um, a lot of issues around funding. Um, it's not been sufficient. Uh, in many cases, applications that have been in and approved, you still haven't gotten your funding. Uh, Joel and I and SCORE and SBC, SBDCs across the country have been intimately involved in helping clients manage the process from do I qualify for what, how much, how do we apply, and then we work with local banks that are actually going through the administration of the loan programs. Uh, so that is one issue, uh, and I'll call on uh, Mike, Dan, or Tim uh, as co-participants here to share any experiences that they might think pertinent to the rest of our group about the funding experiences that your companies have had. Dan, I'll call on you first. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but can Joel, can you stop sharing your screen so that we can go into full gallery mode? Thank you. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Be a lot of people on the screen. Thank you. Dan, you and I have had several conversations about the funding process. Can you just add some color and depth? Um, as far as the funding, yeah, um, yeah I mean, uh, I think the 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 PPP was um, what where we thought it was going to go was that it was going to be uh, the money was that the clock was going to start ticking on those eight weeks once we were able to reopen. Um, but basically what happened was they, you know, decided to start that clock ticking right away. Um, and what it basically does is it, is it makes the unemployment, unemployment numbers look lower than they actually are. It makes the economy look better. But from an operator's perspective, it really doesn't help us um, a whole lot. Um, obviously helps us with some rent and some utilities. Um, but uh, without operating, the PPP really isn't what we thought it was going to be. Thank you. And, and you know that, our industry knows that. The National Restaurant Association, as many of you are members, either of the state or the National Association, I've been in contact with them about their actions. Um, they're very involved with uh, Congress, advocating changes to PPP so that it fits the restaurant industry. Uh, this timing issue, um, the focus on employees and uh, property and utilities is not sufficient. So that national organization is very aggressively advocating on behalf of the industry to fix some of the issues, understanding, believing that there's going to be future programs coming out that, uh, that will apply to this industry. So um, Mike or Tim, do you have anything to add to the funding experience? Well, uh, I, Tom, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, so we did take advantage of the PPP program. Um, you know, we've this stayed is, open. Uh, this is Tim talking? Yeah, this is Tim. We've mm -hmm. stayed open, uh, you know, from the get go of this. We've kept uh, a handful of uh, people employed. Um, you know, we were using those funds uh, for, you know, by the book for payroll, mortgage payments, uh, rents. Um, all those things that we're still obligated to. Um, I suspect that when we get to the end of this and uh, it, c it comes time to pay the piper, um, you know, we're going to come up short. And um, the way we looked at it was, you know, look, it's, uh, it's a ridiculously low interest rate loan at that point. Um, I'm assuming we'll get credit for those things that were qualified and receive our forgiveness for those items and whatever's left uh, that we weren't uh, able to use uh, by the book, then we're going to be obligated to, to, to repay uh, 
at a low interest rate. It's still a, a um, non-recourse loan, uh, uh, half a percent interest. Uh, at least today, the rules say it's a, a two-year uh, payback. But, um, you know, in following this and, and listening to the rumblings from the industry, uh, it appears that, uh, you know, maybe we're going to see some, some movement uh, on, the, on the side of the federal government and making some modifications that will ultimately benefit restaurants. Very good. Mike Osborne? Yeah, I, I um, have kind of taken the same philosophy that Tim has taken. I mean, we're using the PPP uh, as it's intended, uh, rent, utilities. Um, the um, payroll component of it is very difficult to, uh, to use effectively uh, for the things that we mentioned, you know, people reluctant to return to work and so forth. Um, we're kind of operating with a skeleton crew. Um, so I, I, unless it, unless the eight week period is extended, I don't think we're going to be able to fully utilize it either. Um, so I hope that those uh, lobbying efforts uh, continue, uh, you know, by the restaurant association, both state and local. That's really the only way that I think we're going to be able to fully utilize the uh, payroll component of it. Thank you, so Tom, so, I've got a couple of comments, please. I'd like to just please. make sure that everybody's on the same understanding. So first of all, Tim, it's a 1% interest rate. Not, it originally came out as a half, but it, it, before, you, before anybody got their money, basically, they changed it to 1%. Uh, that, that is absolutely correct. Loan forgiveness is achievable if you can spend 75% or more of the loan funds towards personnel costs. Um, I know that that's difficult, especially for the um, restaurant and, and, and bar uh, segment of, of our industry. However, the, there was a, a, a secondary funding source called the IDLE loan, Economic Injury Disaster Loan, and that was, that was put in place to provide six months of operating expenses. So if you did not have an opportunity to go apply for that, I would encourage you to do that. Um, the website to access that uh, is not, is the sba.gov. You do not actually apply to, with a lender. You apply with the SBA directly, uh, which is really the Treasury Department um, sending the money uh, directly to you. Um, that is a 30-year loan. That is a 2% interest rate. So as an example, if you borrowed $30,000 on in that program, your payments are about $183 a month. And the first, uh, uh, the first payment is not due for 11 months uh, after you receive those funds. So, The funding for that program has been exhausted, though. If you go to their it website has. today, yeah. you'll yeah. see that. Yeah. So, so we, could, we could go down a rabbit hole on this uh, funding issue for, for three hours pretty easy. But the funding programs are there. They have been uh, expended and reloaded. Uh, everybody knows that the amount of funding coming into the to the economy generally is not sufficient. Uh, we can hope, we can expect that the programs that are in place idle is part of the uh, disaster recovery uh, uh, financing programs that are there as part of our government uh, support uh, for any disaster. But uh, they're expended now, but just keep your eye on idle and PPP. There will be different funding levels. There will be more money added. There'll be changes made. The money was put in play very quickly. Uh, the rules were kind of one size fits all. There's a lot of nuances around different segments and, and, and we can hope that those things are gonna be worked out by people in our governments uh, working in collaboration with banks. So um, just, just one other additional point on the funding issue. I, I spent some time talking to a regional bank uh, yesterday, late, talking about um, their, their efforts and their role in getting funds into your hands and other, and other segments. Uh, they know and they're preparing that this money is just a Band-Aid, that when companies to come back online and rebuild, uh, you're going to need working capital in whatever form. So the banks are now talking about what does it look like for them working with you all, working with businesses 
uh, to support your needs going forward. And they expect it's going to be a lot more than the funding that they have helped you get through these federal programs. So um, begin those conversations with your local lenders now. Uh, be thinking about uh, what your future is going to look like and what funds you might need. Uh, do some cash flow forecasting and do some budgeting so you can open those conversations with your lenders that you've worked with for PPP uh, to prepare for the future because you will need additional funds. You will need their support uh, beyond what they've been able to connect you with. So enough on that and we and there's a lot more issues on funding and Joel and I will be available after this call uh, to help and assist. We have literally helped hundreds of different businesses between SCORE and SBDC over the past uh, six weeks. One other issue that I wanted to bring up and this was seated by, uh, by the three people I, that, that, that we've asked for help is that um, during the shutdown, uh, Many of you have been able to uh, shift your business model and stay in business and generate revenues. Some have closed, and you've probably noticed that there's already been some notification of permanent closures of some of our local food and restaurant, uh, bar and restaurant uh, peers, which is very unfortunate. Um, uh, I think that there will be more of those notifications coming up in the weeks and months ahead. Uh, we hope not, uh, but uh, it's a difficult time that some people will not be able to uh, to shift or change their business model. So um, changing business model is how you structure your business, how you do business, how you operate, how you connect with your customers, how you deliver your products and services to still generate revenue, generate uh, revenue and, and stay into a position in the market. So when you do come back, you're you're still in the mind of your customers. Um, business model shifts have included going to phone and online ordering. People who already do uh, delivery are already doing that well. The curbside and pickup business has exploded across the country, and there's a lot of you that are doing that with your companies. Uh, it is, uh, in many cases, your operations aren't built to do online ordering, phone ordering, and curbside uh, delivery. So you've had to modify your business operation and your staffing model uh, to uh, deliver your product and service in that way. Um, so I might have, uh, again, starting with you, Mike, because uh, I've been a customer of your curbside service. And when Mike first did his curbside at uh, Miss Mamie's, it was Mike and a few staff in the kitchen and his wife in the front of the house doing the phone orders and delivery to the curb. So Mike, you wanna talk a little bit about your experience and what your thoughts are about uh, how this component of your business may morph going forward. Yeah, I think that uh, it was a real eye opener. Uh, you know, our business was about 90% uh, uh, dine-in, 10% uh, takeaway. Obviously, now it's 100% takeaway. So going to 100% takeaway was was quite an eye opener. Uh, so we kind of developed a system with uh, numbered parking spaces and and. Uh, and uh, tables with that corresponded to the parking spaces where we staged the food and so forth. And really what we're limited by now is the, uh, the amount of phone lines that we have. So we, we're, we're expanding that capacity with additional phone lines. Um, and then an online ordering component that, uh, that we have currently at, uh, at Half Nelson, which will we'll reopen today. Um, but our other restaurants, uh, Miss Mamie's will be up and running with that uh, probably next week. Um, and that'll expand that, that takeaway capacity uh, significantly. So, but it, it's been a real eye opener. We have expanded it to uh, additional employees. I think now we function with about uh, five, five to six employees uh, per day for the uh, carry out per shift. Actually, we run a lunch and dinner shift. And uh, it's it's uh, it's it's working quite well. I mean, it's about 
30% of the revenue, the daily revenue that we had before. Um, so not, it's, it's not all doom and gloom. 30% uh, of what we had before is, is pretty mere. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's been a, like I said, it's been a learning experience, but um, each day, each day, I think we get a little better at it. So. Um, Thank you, Mike. Yep. Tim, you've been pretty aggressive in pushing your uh, pickup and curbside business. You want to talk a little bit yeah. about what's, what's worked for you? Yeah, sure. So, um, uh, you know, I, I, we're not doing quite as well, certainly not 30% uh, of our, our regular business. Of course, this time of year is our, our haymaking season. Uh, I'd say we're running uh, somewhere in the neighborhood on food only. We're running somewhere in the neighborhood uh, at 20 uh, to 25% of our food business. But uh, what's been our real savior, of course, has been beer. Um, we, uh, you know, the only thing that was holding us back initially, I think we lost a week of ground because we couldn't get our hands on growlers. But uh, as soon as we got in, um, as soon as that started flowing in, the uh, business just kind of came back to life. Uh, I was surprised that um, the more uh, uh, restaurants that, that were open or doing carry out and, and had tap beer weren't taking advantage of that, but they may have fallen into the same problem that we had, which was not having the accessibility to growlers. Uh, how are some sort of vessel to put beer in to go? Um, ABD has been helpful in, in modifying the, the rules and laws associated with uh, sending alcohol out the door. And, and uh, so, of course, we took full advantage of that and started to do mixed drinks and those types of things paired with specials and features. So, um, uh, all told, we're probably in that uh, the 25 percent uh, of our, our usual business for this time of year. Um, and I'm speaking strictly at the our pub and eatery location. Mm -hmm. uh, the brewery, obviously, um, uh, as a bar, uh, you know, we, we're not able to open, although we, we have been doing um, uh, carry out uh, curbside delivery of beer on Friday evenings and throughout the day on Saturday and Saturday afternoon while the farmer's market's taking place. And, and that's proven to be uh, effective. So um, all in all, I, you know, we're doing the best we can. Uh, of course, the key to this is top of mind awareness right now, staying in front of those people that are, that are, um, uh, you know, buying carry out food. Uh, we've struggled because we didn't have an online uh, ordering system, which we're in the process of implementing now. Uh, we should have a full rollout of that late next week. Um, that's a fully integrated system through, through Aloha that's going to allow us to uh, have customers place those orders and, and, you know, send directly to the kitchen um, and, and fairly automated process. Uh, we too suffer from a lack of phone lines, um, obviously going from a relatively small amount of carry out business to basically a full time carry out business has, has been uh, uh, a struggle from a phone perspective. Uh, Staffing is also interesting. You just don't know when you're going to get hit and what time of day. Um, uh, some of the larger uh, employers here in town have uh, been gracious enough to feed their employees and spread that business around a bit. So, uh, of course, we've we've taken advantage of that. So, um, you know, all things uh, being equal, I think we're we're doing okay right now. Thank you, Tim. So, uh, Tim and Mike's comments are examples of uh, experiences that they and all of you have. I'm featuring these three uh, today. We would open any of you to be uh, featured and talk about your experiences, ideas, best practices in our future meetings. Uh, you all compete. You're all after the same customers, the same food and beverage dollar in the Quad Cities. But this is a time when uh, we, as a community, you as an industry sector in this in this community, need to work together. So if if one of you is uh, uh, addressing the challenges, developing new tools and processes. It would behoove us all uh, to have the ability to share those experiences and those ideas with our peers so that we can help our industry uh, survive. Um, uh, there will be a little bit of uh, survival of the fittest, uh, but we can help. We can help others become fit. So. Um, we had a vibrant industry here. We want to bring that back. Dan, you are just going to curbside. Last Saturday was your first time. You are known as a bar business at Armory Gardens. 
you have a hundred beers on the wall and you, you have food as an auxiliary. Um, why did you move to curbside and what has your experience been after three days? Come off mute. Yeah. Dan? Yep. All right. Um, yeah, well, we basically moved to curbs curbside uh, because the PPP money started. Uh, so our, our thought process was since we have to pay the employees anyway, um, because we want to do whatever we can to make sure it's forgivable, we might as well try to get some income coming in the door. Um, we are a bar first. Um, that is the draw to our location. Uh, kitchen is kind of secondary, but um, you know, this downtime basically allowed us to add a second phone line um, to try to, uh, you know, make sure that that when people call, it's not busy. Um, we're currently looking into online ordering, uh, but we just don't want to take on too much. We're also limiting our hours between four and eight every day um, to really try to, to, to get some kind of critical mass in that time, as opposed to stretching out between 11 and nine, 11 a.m. and 9 p.m. like we normally are um, to, to try to limit you know, the hours that we're open. Very good. Okay, so others will have examples like this and be thinking uh, um, for our future meetings what you might uh, contribute along this subject. So changing business models and one of the uh, one of the realities is that in the near term, in the near term, maybe three, six months or longer, uh, with social distancing requirements and limited capacity requirements, the economics of your restaurants and bars will change you will have a limited ability to generate the level of revenue that you have in the past. So for sure and certain, you're going to have to adapt your organizational structure, your staffing levels, your operations, um, your inventory management, and all of that will need to be adapted to address a very different economic uh, model than what you have experienced up until the 1st of March. Um, so this is another area where uh, sharing what you're doing to adapt your business to lower volume um, will be important. And also what's been happening here is that you have the restrictions of social, social uh, distancing and lower uh, capacity of a restaurant. You've also had people, as you'll hear from our survey results, there's a lot of people that until there's a vaccine will not go out to eat again. Uh, so there is a segment of our local population, national population that will choose to stay home, will not go out for whatever reason and not be available as customers regardless of the capacity issues that we just talked about. And um, just speaking from my own personal experience, people have gotten um, re, uh, reacquainted with home cooking. So there'll be a lot of people that uh, instead of going out to eat, will enjoy cooking at home, uh, buying groceries and doing whatever that they may not have done for months or years. And that's certainly the case with me. Dan, do you have a comment? I saw you raise Yeah, I mean, you know, I think in the discussions with my business partner, um, I, th I think j just some words of encouragement. I think being in the Quad Cities um, is actually one of the better places to be in the country. I think in places like New York City, Chicago, major, major metropolitan areas where this thing can spread at a very rapid rate, I think people are going to be a lot more apprehensive. Um, I think in the Quad Cities, people, if you look at the traffic around town, people are, re are ready to get back to normal. Um, 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 and in talking to several people uh, throughout this, uh, the last seven weeks, um, that they seem to echo that. I mean, I think people are ready to get back out. So just some words of encouragement is I think, you know, it, it is going to be tough. Um, but at the same time, I think our community is more likely uh, to jump back into restaurants and bars than most. Yeah. Tim, Tim Baldwin has just recently done a survey, and I'll have him talk about that in a few minutes. But um, People will re-engage. They will go back to the restaurants and bars that they've enjoyed, but there was a significant percentage, both in the survey that Tim did locally and the National Restaurant Association survey that was just done last week. There is a very large percentage of people that will go out less frequently for whatever reason mm -hmm. or won't go back at all until there's a vaccine. And whether that's 10% or 20% or 40%, hopefully here in the Quad Cities, there'll be a majority, a larger number that will feel comfortable going back. And I think you all will contribute to that confidence. The actions that you take 
will encourage or discourage people to come back. And we won't get into the details here, but in our next two meetings, we'll be talking about specifics of what this next phase of re-engagement with our customers will look like. One other topic uh, that I wanted to uh, talk about during the shutdown period is marketing. Uh, and I've I watched this industry very closely um, because I'm interested in it uh, from my own personal background, but also with SCORE, we work with 400 local clients and a lot of those are food and beverage owner operators, um, is marketing. Marketing is an important uh, function throughout in every business, but staying connected with your customers now uh, when you may not be operating or you're operating at a limited uh, capacity is absolutely critical. Keeping your, your business name, um, uh, your, your offerings, your value in front of your customers during this period is very, very important. So, uh, Tim, you've been pretty active in uh, marketing. You want to talk a little bit about marketing during the shutdown to keep a connection with your customers, uh, keep your value proposition in front of them, keep your position in the market clear. Yeah, sure. So, um, of course, that's something we all struggle with, right? Uh, there's lots of things to do every day, and one of the last things we think about is getting our our product, our face, our brand, our image out in front of uh, our consumers. Um, you know, we've we've tried to double down on those efforts, but at the same time, you know, we we haven't been able to employ the the, set, the same staff that we have, uh, you know, pr previous to this. So, um, you know. Uh, Obviously, social media is key. Um, the, I'm sure, if not all of you, you should be on the uh, QC emergency takeout page that, that Matt Stern created. I think there's, uh, at least when I looked last night, I think we were approaching 29,000 uh, uh, members of that group. Um, I've, I've seen comments and heard comments from people that uh, uh, they discovered new restaurants uh, from participating in that group. Uh, Restaurants I didn't know existed in the Quad Cities. Uh, it's it's bringing to light uh, a lot of folks that um, that have uh, you know just been quiet or or, or uh, uh, not in the forefront, and it's, it's bringing exposure to a lot of people. We, we've gotten a, a, a fair amount of exposure from that uh, page, and I would encourage you all to um, uh, post something there, if not weekly, if multiple times a week, uh, daily features or specials or whatever you've got going on. Uh, you got stuff that's getting close to gate code in the kitchen. Uh, get it out there. Send it out on special. Um, of course, through our own uh, uh, social media uh, sites, uh, we've seen a significant amount of organic growth uh, on those sites. Uh, again, I attribute that to um, our marketing activities, but also to that that uh, Facebook group that Matt created. Um, that's been key. Uh, leveraging your employees friends, family, everybody that can be sharing and, and spreading your message um, is important. Um, one thing we've tried to avoid uh, is trying to attract people uh, with price. Um, it's, about, it's hard enough to make money uh, as it stands, and if we start giving our product away, um, it's going to make it impossible to make money. Um, tap on it, uh, Katie, uh, you know, offering the free uh, tap on it promotion. Uh, to to restaurants uh, here in the Quad Cities, um, we took advantage of that. I think we ran uh, we ran last Wednesday. Um, normally, when we run a tap on a deal, uh, we'll see a couple of hundred redemptions in the first few days. Um, we ran Wednesday, and as of uh, I think they end that on Saturdays. They're cut off. But when I got my report on Monday, we had just 29 redemptions. So um, that was surprising to us, but. Um, um, you know, it makes sense. Uh, there's, you know, people uh, only have so many places that they can uh, uh, spread money around. Um, and now that they, uh, you know, they're not going to come to us every day. They're going to go to you every day. They want to spread it around. So, so, uh, so yeah, Tim, that's, that's I just, Tim, I just saw something pop up on the screen. Is that you sharing? No, that's that me. Sh me. No, that's okay. me sharing. Uh, Eastern Iowa Community College sent out a survey uh, regarding. Um, restaurant issues uh, and we've gotten 400 responses in just three days and so th these are the uh, uh, categories of the responses that regarding future dining habits so I just wanted to have that up on the screen as 
Do you want to highlight some points here, Joel? You want to highlight? Um, yeah, this gets to what we've been talking about here. Um, this not not everyone is going to return and 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 start to uh, live in the way and behave as customers the way they have before. So um, this is just one of the inputs, and Tim did one locally here. Um, there, yeah, there, there is a lot of our population that uh, is not going to be confident or comfortable in re-engaging uh, and, and behaving the way they have before the crisis, which goes to the point we're going to have different economics, fewer people, uh, less revenue, uh, probably more cost associated with marketing, for example, a more difficulty of managing the cost structure within the operation. Uh, so this is coming forward. Uh, thank you for putting that up, Joel. Yep. And whenever you see something like this, when we can, we will share information that we're gathering from the various different entities that we're a part of, whether it be SBDC or SCORE or the state governments we're working with or the SVA or the National Restaurant Association. While I'm thinking about it, uh, Mike Osborne and I have been talking about the uh, uh, the local Quad Cities uh, Restaurant Association, which is, uh, I don't know if it's dead, but it's certainly not active, uh, that this would be an appropriate time, and it may be a temporary activity, to reinvigorate the local restaurant associations so that we have a forum where we can meet and talk and share outside of what we're doing here with the chamber. Uh, that's something that Mike and I will talk about and, and encourage and invite all of you to be a part of that so that we have a place that we can uh, think, talk, and work, and make some things happen for the benefit of our local industry. So more on that later. Uh, Dan Bush, can you talk, you're a good marketer. I respect uh, your business acumen and you, uh, some of the creative things you do with marketing. You were closed for a while, but you still kept your name and your business and your value prop in front of your customers. What did you do? Uh well, yeah, I mean, first of all, I think, um, you know, a mistake we made last year with the bad winter and the bad flood was, you know, one of the first things that we cut down on was our marketing budget. Um, because when the money's not really coming in, uh, it, it's kind of the, the easiest thing to cut. Um, because we, you know, do boosted Facebook ads, and we were running commercials and, and all sorts of things. And it was a huge mistake. I mean, I think now's the time where um, you have to get in front of people and you have to consistently be in front of people. Um, the beauty of social media is that you can do a lot of things for free. Um, if, if you have engaging content, um, then people will uh, attach to your brand and, and you'll be at, at the front of their mind. Um, and what we've learned about social media, what we were, the mistake that we were making was just trying to inform and basically put up ads and now we're really shifting to um, creating content that's funny or educational or, or just relatable. So treat, treat your social media presence as a human being and not as a business um, and try to provide that voice to your customer. Um, but again, it, don't, you don't want to overdo it and constantly be posting. You don't have to post several times a day. In fact, you shouldn't. Um, you know, if you have you know, four to five quality posts a week just to be in the front of mind, um, you know, you can hire an amateur photographer for 100, 150 bucks to come in and take pictures of all your menu items. Um, and then you can have an inventory of, of, of stock photos to kind of work through um, instead of trying to create something new every day. Um, another thing that we're working on is, is a social media calendar just to kind of keep track of, of, of what we can talk about at what points um, in the week. And, and, um, and, and again, just the name of the game is staying at, at, in the front of people's mind. Thank you, Dan. Tim, you have recently done a survey of over a thousand people. Can you just highlight some of the key things that you have learned from the feedback you've gotten? Yeah, if you like, I can share my screen, but I think, Joel, you got to stop sharing yours. Yep, happy to, happy to flip it over to you, Mike. Okay, let me... Uh, this is to Tim, Tim Baldwin. Yeah, let me get here. Uh, <clears throat> Oh, no, I can't uh, share my, okay, here we go. Okay. Here we go. 
Okay, so uh, for those of you that uh, aren't uh, on video, uh, I, I did a survey. I think I launched this on Monday morning, Monday midday. Uh, as of right now, I'll just do a quick refresh. Uh, there are uh, 1,056 respondents. Uh, just starting at the top here, um, you know what I was what I was trying to figure out. Obviously, some of these are loaded uh, for, for Front Street's business and and to address some. Uh, questions and concerns that came up in some of our internal meetings, but I think they apply to everybody here today. So, uh, first question was uh, if restaurants in Iowa, in the Iowa Quad Cities, were allowed to reopen on May 16th, when would you expect to dine out again? Uh, the uh, if you the first three, uh, you, you look at that first, and the first one, 29.1 percent, says not for at least 45 days. But the encouraging thing about those first three, uh, the first being 29.1 percent not for at least 45 days um 26 uh, percent was immediately and 25.3 percent was before the end of may so that tells me that somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 85 percent of these respondents are going to be going out to restaurants within the next 45 days That's right important. or within 45 days of when we reopen so good there were uh, uh almost 12 percent of the respondents that said possibly not at all this year and I did leave a, uh, an option there for folks to write in their preference. And uh, I know, Tom, you read through those. I have as well. Um, the long and short of all of those write-ins was that, uh, you know, like Tom said, not till there's a vaccine, uh, not till we see some downward movement in the, you know, uh, infection trends and so forth. But uh, I think, at least for my survey, the overwhelming majority uh, will be back, you know, butts in seats uh, within 45 days. Now, there's some caveats to that as we move forward. Um, if curbside uh, carryout delivery remains an option going forward, uh, how often would you use these uh, services? Of course, this one we did specifically for ourselves. We were trying to make a decision on whether or not we were going to invest in an online uh, ordering system. Um, uh, overwhelming majority here, 57.5% said that they are going to do it uh, three times or more per month. They're going to do carryout uh, delivery or curbside. Um, 30.6% said they would do it sometimes, uh, which was uh, once or twice a month. 10.8% uh, said rarely. That was less than once a month. And 1% said never. So uh, I think that the writings on the wall here, for those of us who work traditionally in the carryout business, um, it's going to be a critical part of your business moving forward, uh, provided that yours is the type of business that can, you know, send food out the door that, you know, uh, travels well. Uh, then we started talking about, uh, you know, sanitizing and masks and all those things. So some feedback from those moving down. I wish I would have structured the, the answers for this differently because I did get some feedback. Tom, you probably noticed it when you read all the responses that um, some people wish they could have clicked on, you know, uh, one being the highest priority. They wanted to click on one on every one of these in some cases. So. When you look at these, if you see a nice uh, pattern, a nice straight line pattern uh, or a 45 degree angle pattern, uh, it means likely that they were all equally important, okay? So um, again, one being the highest five, you know, depending on the number of questions, uh, the higher number being the lowest priority. Uh, I asked of the following social distancing practices, please rank which are most important to you when deciding whether or not to visit a particular restaurant. Um, uh, oh, the first uh, increased spacing uh, of seating areas, that was uh, ranked 2.2 out of the four questions. Uh, reduced overall capacity, ranked 2.3 out of the four questions. Outdoor seating ranked 2.7 out of the four questions. And keep that in mind for a second, because I want to talk about that again as we get down further in the survey. And then call ahead seating, so there's no waiting on site for your table, that ranked 2.8. So. Outdoor seating and call ahead, obviously, uh, were not as high a priority as increased spacing and reduced overall capacity. Tim, Tim we've got about four minutes left, and you have a lot of information here. So um, why don't you and I work to summarize this that we can share? And I know you don't want to share this data and a link to the data, but maybe a summary of this data would be helpful for those on the call. Yeah, my thought was, uh, so as not to, uh, unfortunately, I, I've got a back end here. And if I share the link, I give everybody access to my back end, uh, but I will take screenshots of this, Tom, okay. and um, send them to you to be distributed. Very good. So 
Tim has done this. It's very current. It's very relevant. It's very local. Um, Joel showed you the survey that was done in Iowa. I have one from the National Restaurant Association. So that will provide you with some intel that will be important for you like Tim has done. You know, should I do curbside or not? Should I buy a new POS system or not? Um, we can help provide you data and information that helps you make more informed decisions. That's one of the roles that, uh, that SBDC and SCORE and the Chamber and you all working together can help do. And a lot of those important decisions about your future are going to be made in the next 30 to 60 days. Uh, today's call, we focused on the experiences during the shutdown, uh, lessons learned, best practices. Uh, on our next call coming up on the 21st, we want to talk about your reopening experience. Um, many of you um, that aren't operating on curbside or, or, or a delivery will have some um, activity in reopening your operations. So on our next call, we'll talk about that. And uh, I will uh, explore others on our call that may be featured like we have with uh, Dan and Mike and Tim today to share your experiences with the group. Um, so we have kind of a hard, hard stop at 1125 and we're up to that point now. Uh, Joel has just put up a slide that uh, has got his and my contact information. Uh, we will provide, or this will be posted on the Chamber website, the recording and the slides. Um, SCORE has 40 local mentors. So we have people uh, from um, every industry, as you can imagine here locally, that can that can assist. And uh, Joel has a depth and breadth of knowledge and experience, and we're both connected to networks of people in our regions that can help, including the SBA, including uh, state governments, and uh, the trade and professional associations that we've talked about. So we can be your conduit to those information resources as you need. Um, well, I Joel, appreciate you. Um taking the time, it's, this is a really important conversation. Um, as Tom mentioned, we're gonna continue the conversation. Uh, we have two more dates on the books, May 21st at 9 a.m., June 11th at 9 a.m. So this peer roundtable group, uh, the chamber has a peer roundtable <coughs> program, if you're not familiar with it. Um, we have some other restaurant owners who have been participating. Um, some of them are by topic, some of them are by role. And so I imagine that this uh, bar and restaurant peer roundtable group that has been organized during this time of crisis um, will continue because uh, this is going to last a while and the evolution is, is going to look different over time. So this has been a really important conversation. We do have the toolkit at the Chamber website that has recommendations and things to consider as you reopen. Um, lots of resources to share. Those will go out um, after the meeting. And um, again, Joel is available and Tom and his team are available and uh, please utilize them and the chamber as well for resource connections and uh, consultation during this time. Thanks everybody, hey, thanks for joining Ju us. Julie, hey, this is Kyle. If anybody can hang on, I had a little bit of Davenport news I wanted to share if we can. Go ahead. Just real briefly, I wanted people to know that Davenport is in the process of creating their own grant program for small businesses. They got about a million dollars from the federal side of CDBG funding and they're looking to produce a new uh, small business assistance program. So I think you're going to hear about that in the next couple of weeks of the format and the function of that program and one of that on people's radar. Uh, additionally, in downtown, we're going to be upping our marketing game here pretty soon and we're exploring working with the city to loosen some ordinances about down, downtown outdoor dining so that we could potentially um, help restaurants who have um, reduced capacity. So those are all things that we're working with and I will close with reiterating that I've found the National Restaurant Association to be really on the game and that I agree that uh, we definitely need uh, some federal changes to PPP and others but that they've done a good job of that. So if you guys are not following National Restaurant Association, I really encourage you to. I think they've got their act together. Thank you, Carl. 
Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Joel. Um, we're, we're at close here. And then there's a meeting time survey. If you could submit uh, best time for you, um, 9 a.m. or 3 p.m. if you could fill that out as you leave the meeting. Thanks for joining today. Thanks, Joel. Have, Thank have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye now.